Hello, 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 hello. Chris Noosh here once again. And I just wanted to click on the camera and talk about something that I've been thinking a lot about recently. The little lessons that I learned while I was doing my undergrad at Kennesaw State University. For those of you who do not know, I have a degree in drawing, painting, and printmaking, a bachelor's from Kennesaw State. And they're one of the most important things that I took away was the relationships that I've made with the teachers and professors uh, that I encountered there. So I wanted to come on and I wanted to share with you one lesson some, from some of the most influential professors that I had in the four, four and a half years that I was at Kennesaw State. So first off, we're gonna start with Katherine Taylor. She was uh, my drawing two professor, drawing one and drawing two professor. One of the things that she taught me was how to think about cross contours. And I've used this a lot in my work to kind of show the shape of a form. That's what cross contours do. They kind of show the shape. And this is how you make your lines move with the shape. You want it to go with the shape of the form. But she explained it to me in a very simple way and I wanted to share that with you. So if you think about an ant walking on the surface of a material, of anything in the whole entire world. If you think of that ant walking, and that ant can only walk in one single straight line, that line is the cross contour of that shape. That ant can go in any direction. I've got a piece of a roll of masking tape here to kind of illustrate this. This masking tape, as you know, is round. When I turn it this way, that line is a straight line. But as soon as I turn it this way, that line becomes on a flat surface, a U. Or if I turn it this way, it's kind of like a, like a C almost. You want, if you're drawing and you want to indicate form with line, you want your carving marks or your cross hatching or any other marks that you're making to go with, to move with the form of the object that you're drawing. And I'll show you an example of my work there that follows those theories. You see all the lines and how they kind of follow whatever I'm showing you, because I don't know exactly what that is yet. Yeah. All right. Second, I'm going to move on to um, my photography teacher. I had him for, his name is Addison Will. And I think he moved to like Tulsa. I don't know if he's still around there, but he was there for, I kind of saw for like one year. Um, didn't have much experience with him, but he, he was a crazy dude. He taught the, one of the classes all, he, he didn't speak the whole entire class and he just mimed everything. And it was one of the most important classes. It was how to develop the film. And he didn't talk the whole class. He just mimed it the whole time. Talk about how to spin off the canister lid and everything. But it's it's up there, so it must have worked. But one of, one of the things that he said and told me, and it's stuck with me to this day, is that it's hard to make art while you're chasing the almighty dollar. Which is very, very true. Because if you're in art to make money, then you're going to just make things that other people want when art in its truest form is making stuff that you want to work on and make happy. So it's hard to find that Venn diagram of things people want and things that make you happy and things that make that that is is your work. You got to find that little intersection where those two worlds come together. Um, it's really hard to do, but I remember that he said it's difficult to do it, not impossible. It just takes work, just takes thought, and it just takes finding that right audience for your work as well. But that's always been up there in my mind, just something to think about. Next was my computer applications teacher, Philip Webb. And once again, had him for one semester. And the one thing that I took away from his class was just to be really, really organized with when you're working on digital stuff. And I've taken that to not to the extreme measure that we had to in his class, which was uh, different folders upon folders upon po folders upon folders, and just layers and layers and layers of, of uh, things and folders and naming the files with four underscores and everything. But I do, when I do freelance work, like to keep everything really, really organized. Um, I save different state proofs of the progress in case I need to move backwards, I have a version one, version two, version three, version four, version five. If I need to, if I'm at version five, if 
but the client says they like version two better. I better have version two ready so I don't have to go from version five back to version two. I can just open up version two and start working from there. It's really important, especially when you're working by the hour. You don't want to rack up those hours on people doing work that you've already done. Now I'm going to move on to my painting professors. I have a, one of my concentrations was painting and I was, it took a lot of painting classes, painting one, painting two, painting three. And I took five courses of advanced painting uh, from all from acrylic. To, we didn't actually, I didn't do much acrylic. I do a lot of acrylic now, um, but it was mostly watercolor and oil paint. So I did a lot of oil painting back then. Oil painting, it was fun but it's very isolating. And that kind of made me sad because if you're working on the same painting over and over and over and over, over the course of a couple of days, I like to keep moving. I want a new ideas pumping out all the time. And if I want to slow down, print making gives me that too. I can, I can slow down and work on one piece off on a tangent there. Like whoop, go back to what I was talking about before the lessons. So I want to introduce you to Don Robson who was probably the painting teacher that I had the most. Um, he was a, he's an amazing painter. Look, whole piece of his work there. Check it out. It's awesome. He, he works with a, like really subtle things and like really nice little pops of color in like these in landscapes of gray. He also does like a lot of little miniature paintings, paintings of miniatures or paintings are giant, but his, his subjects are tiny. Like, the people in model train cities. But the one thing that Don taught me uh, was color, color theory was one thing that was really big, but he encouraged us in drawing three, which was human anatomy to make a resource for ourselves. A little sketchbook that is basically a rewriting of all of the notes that we took in that class. How the class was structured, it was two days a week, probably like a Monday and a Wednesday, and on the first day of the week, we would have a lecture about the group of bones, the group of muscles or whatever we were studying that week. And then on the second day of the week, we would have a live model come into class and model. And we would have to draw those, that muscle group or that bone group through the skin of the model that we were looking at. And then sometimes once we had it all together, he would want us to just draw the human form as we're looking. What I have here, like I said, this is something that I still reference to this day, is a book of all the notes in that class that I took organized by the different bones and skeletal groups just on different unique ways to think about the human form. And like I said, I still reference this to this day of how things work in the body how the diff different muscles work, the different just basic shapes of the front and the back of the body. There's an ab page. So this, this, basic, this really helps me anytime I have to draw any sort of form. I even use it uh, to draw animals that are, I'm anthropomorphizing, that I'm making to look like human. Um, so I, do I use it all the time. This is uh, a very valuable resource and very, very valuable lesson that Don Robson had left me. All right, next was Joe Remillard. Joe Remillard is a very, very, very talented, very technical painter. Look, there's a painting right there. He actually incorporated some of my work into the background of his painting once. This is the painting, that's the painting I'm showing you here. A very important lesson that he taught me was to find one line. When I draw, I'm very, 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 very sketchy with what I'm doing. I'll take my pencil and I'll kind of make shapes, make scribbles, make a lot of little tiny marks and he's he stepped back and he told me one day he's like you've got a lot of really great lines on that work on that piece i was uh i was drawing a, a human bust like a greek a greek form and he said i want you to find the perfect line out of the 15 lines that i had drawn to indicate the side of that form so i did it's about finding that one perfect line in the sketching of lines that you have already created. So when you're sketching and you have really a lot of work put down on the paper, that history of work can help you as you move towards the final in finding that one final line. Those other lines aren't gone. They helped you and they built together to make the perfect line for you. And last but not least, I'm gonna talk about printmaking teachers. I had, I had 
I think I only had two of them. I'm trying to remember. And hopefully I don't forget anybody in this video because I had a lot of really great teachers. And it's one of the hesitations I had with making this video. One of my professors that I had for one semester, uh, Jerusha Graham, I worked with her after college when I was on the board of directors for the Atlanta Printmaker Studio. So I've become very familiar with her and she's become uh, a friend of mine who I haven't seen in a while because of all this COVID stuff. But that's where we are. Um, but I would consider her a friend today. She spoke a lot about community and the importance of community and working together, which is important in printmaking. Communal spaces are very popular because equipment is expensive. So she just, she just Im imposed upon me the importance of community and existing in a community. But last but not least is the, probably the teacher I had the most, and that's Valerie Dibble. She, she's a printmaker and she's very super, super supportive. She's almost like a motherly figure to her students. And one of the most important things that I took away from Kennesaw State is the relationship that I was able to maintain with her. I'm nine years graduated at this point and she still calls me and I still text her and we email back and forth. And I've, I've seen her most recently since all this COVID stuff um, happened. And yeah, so she's been a really great teacher. But the one thing that she imposed upon me is to find your voice because it's really, really easy, I think, for an artist to look at your work and then look at other people's work and compare your work to other people's work and try to make your work look like other people's works. But one thing is, and th these aren't words that she used, but your work is never going to be as good as that other person's work if you try to make your work look like that other person's work. You're never gonna be as good as Joe Skakamuku if you are trying to be Joe Skakamuku. Made up a name. So it's really important to find your voice and make your voice come forward rather than trying to sing in the voice of someone else. So that that's the, the lesson that I had there. And it's a very, very important lesson. Just be yourself. Let you shine through your work and just be confident in what you're doing. And just really, really, if you have something that you want to show forward in your work, push it forward something that you're really great at, let that come through. Kennesaw State was a very traditional school. And we did a lot of drawing from nude models. We did a lot of still lifes. We did a lot of Greek busts. We did a lot of just very, very traditional art school things. But with my work, every time, even if I would try to draw like a portrait, here's a portrait that I did uh, way back when, when I brought that portrait in for a drawing class, I was trying to be dead serious. I was like, oh man, I nailed it. I did a really great job. Photo likeness, everything. I brought this portrait in and once it came up, uh, people still laughed at it. They're like, oh, that's a funny drawing because I, everything that I draw made people laugh, made them smile, even if I was just trying to be completely serious. So you should really, like I grab that, move forward and just instead of trying to be a super serious artist, which at times I really wanted to be, I grab my strength, which is humorous, fun, make people smile type work. I grab that and push it forward in my work because that's my voice. That's what I was good at. That's what, that's what I could yell. That's what I could scream. Find what that is. Find your voice in your work. And right now, if you're not super, if you're not super far along in your art career, I encourage you to find whatever your voice is. It's probably whispering right now. It's whispering to you. And whatever that is, just keep pushing it further and further and further. You can look at other people and be inspired by other people, but don't take their voice and put it into your work. Find your own voice. And that's a, a lesson that Valerie Dibble really, uh, I don't think she ever used those words for me. It's something that she uh, really encouraged in people, which was to just find your personal strength and let, let's, let your interests, let your strength come forward in your personal work. Well. That's all I have. Like I said, I hopefully I didn't forget any of the influential teachers that I had. I had a lot more teachers, but for like more, more hands off classes, so to say. Um, so, but that is, uh, that's what I have for you today. Hopefully you enjoyed this crash course in four years of art school to 
some of the, of the most influential lessons that I took home from that. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments. I'll, I'll give it an answer. I'll, I'll try to give it an answer that, to the best of my ability. And if you have any uh, suggestions for future videos, let me know. I'm all ears. I want to talk about that community. I want to, I want to use this space to fill that community void in my life at this time. So if you have any suggestions, let me know. I want to hear them. Once again, thanks for hanging out with me. Thanks for watching and see you guys later. Bye.